Good morning. I'm Gordon Ross from Central Systems. I also like some of you here, also working on Lumos for my day job, or one of the works of Lumos. And for a couple of years, we've uh, been doing lots of things in the uh, Windows file sharing space, and we'll have to talk with you, tell you a little bit about those. I'm, I've tailored this for a developer audience primarily, so I'll have to give you a brief sort of overview of what's happened with the SMB protocol, how it's evolved, uh, and then tell you know, some more detail about the development experience. This is a, this is a fairly large development project. Uh, we have some numbers about that at the end. Forgive me, I'm a little bit and I'm using a different presentation tool than I'm used to, so I'm figuring my way through this because I want to only click to the next slide right now. Okay. So uh, one of the questions that, that often comes up, well, gee, you know, what do we need another, you know, uh, actually want this audience, it's all, who cares about SMB? <laughs> the reason to care is that some 80% of the traffic out there, if you're a structured data file server, you must file or in file or fires to file server, is coming over to one of the SMB protocols. So you need to have a competent implementation of it. Um, SMB1 had started to show some scalability problems. Um, one of the things that happens in a protocol is used for a long time and gets extensions to try to meet new requirements and so forth and, and at the same time maintain backward compatibility. So it basically grows hair. Uh, I went and did a count in our SMB1 dispatch table. There literally are 57 calls to get things done <laughs> in SMB1. I found that amusing, that's why the Heinz 57 thing. Uh, and, and this chattiness has got to be a problem as people use it between data centers in some instances and so forth. So uh, anyway, the folks at Microsoft bit the bullet and uh, started over with took the opportunity to start over, and, and that's what SMB2 um, came from. And, uh, you know, to try to, just, just an aside about Microsoft, Microsoft has really changed their tune quite a bit about standards development and so forth after the uh, EU judgment. You know, in, in part, I think, I don't want to, I don't want to rattle too much on that, but with SMB, when they're trying to document SMB1, I think it became more clear what a mess it had become. <laughs> so anyway, their, their process for developing SMB2 spec was a bit more open, an opportunity for community feedback. Even still, SMB2.0 was kind of an imperfect design, so nobody actually implements SMB2.0, everybody implements SMB2.1. Uh, but some of the reasons for it basically are, it's, you know, with a start, with an opportunity to start over, it's very nice. You only have 18 primitives in it. Uh, you move on to 32-bit or 64-bit IDs for you know, to allow you to scale out, scale larger numbers of clients and open files and so forth. Uh, and, and also the the uh, compounding design in SMB1 was really very limited. There were only certain things you could put together with other things, and SMB2 introduces a more general style of uh, compounding. Uh, and so other features. The, the asterisks, just to point out, I'll get to that. As far as status, you don't have to do everything. There are a bunch of optional features even still. Um, so our, our target was to get to SMB2 as quickly as possible to gain the advantages of the better compounding and better network utilization and plan to add, fill in the, uh, some of the optional features later as demand and our engineering resources permit. Um, so SMB2.1 offers a few sort of interesting things. Um, the previous version of this one we like. People love ZFS and love snapshots, and it, it's cool that the server actually presents those when you write back on a file in the previous version. That, that just works. Uh, SMB3.0, um, a lot of vendors are, are in the process of implementing it. It's interesting, Microsoft kind of changed course there. Just about everything in 3.0 is optional. So you can actually do a checkbox implementation of just negotiating SMB3.0 protocol, saying, okay, we're done. But uh, that would be kind of disingenuous. Um, it does actually require a new signing algorithm. Uh, and it, 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 
offers the opportunity for encryption. That's that's one that's you know as as we do more systems on networks where there is a concern about somebody seeing your traffic, you know, the firewall program protocol. It is it is sort of amusing that we worry. You know, people, our customers worry a lot about. Gee, is the Apple working exactly correctly? Am I not giving access to that guy? And then you remind them, well, you know your file data is going over the wire and clear, right? <laughs> That can change. SMB 3.0 introduces, I think it's 3.0, it might have been introduced earlier. I think it's 3.0. It introduces a, an encryption sort of header frame. So that, and that unfortunately takes us to not only, it bumps us from 18 to 19 primitives, but the 19th one sort of special. It's kind of an encapsulation frame. Uh, we haven't done that yet. But uh, we're, we're working on SMB 3. My, uh, has been moving SMB3 traffic already. Very proud of this work there. So, uh, quickly about status. This is sort of the end of the business part of the presentation. Um, we're shipping this now. You know, SMB2.1 with all the, all the things in the spec that says you have to do. Uh, and aside from this, actually, there, there were a number of areas that in this, in this SMB stack that needed some love. The uh, DC locator one that is one that had, is an area that had been causing us a lot of support problems for quite a while. Uh, it's a lot better with the new implementation, more uh, compliant, closer to compliant with the, uh, with the specifications. Uh, extended security is another one. There's been a, there's an annoying luminous bug out there that if you if you're a domain member and you plug into Explorer, whack whack machine name whatever and not connect for you or complain that you can't be authenticated. That's in part because we needed extended security and it expects to cover us and so forth. So that stuff's filled in now. Um, like I said, we have SMB 3.0 in prototype stage and uh, we're working on filling in some of the optional features and so forth. This is a good point for questions quickly if anybody has any about where we are and so forth. What's that? Are the sources available now? Yes, in the links on the end. Uh, I'm actually prepared to do a little demo with uh, the code that's actually um, prepared for going upstream in the list. The question is about whether the sources of this are available to the CR. So now I'm going to go through, and I'll, let's see if it looks like I need to speed it up a little bit. Just the server design changes. Uh, I find this stuff interesting. The folks in the developer community here, uh, I hope, might as well. Um, I'm not going to get into a whole lot of details, but the ones that I found particularly interesting. One of them, um, one of the more interesting things and in parts of this work that we had to think longer about was uh, the the general threading model for the for the server. The, the model that's there is is a fairly good one. Um, you know, the task queue is a, is a that particularly this is a dynamic task queue. It's, it's a nice way to manage a large amount of work onto a system with many CPUs and allocate those CPUs out for worker threads and so forth. Um, however, it, it can get complicated depending on how much interaction those worker threads need to have and so forth. So we, we like this model, but really didn't want it to get more complicated than, than necessary. So Let's see, and then I wasn't sure how much to go into this, but I'm going to teach you a little bit about SMB message processing. Now you're all going to go to sleep, right? I'll make it quick. Everybody hates SMB, but with SMB1, or most of the message processing models, it's really pretty straightforward. Basically, you get an SMB request. If it has these and x parts, this, this is the limited compounding method that I mentioned from SMB1. There, basically, there's a single shared header that, that gives you information about like, who it is, what tree you're connected to, what shared you're connected to. Uh, and, and a first request, and, and basically the worker, you know, we have one worker working on this message, it walks through the message building out the, the, response, the second part of the response for the second part of the request and the response for the third part, and sends it out. And that's pretty much it. It's a fairly simple model. Locking wise this worker is the only one that needs to know anything about this message itself. That's a, it's a very helpful thing from a scalability and simplicity standpoint. Simple locking models are, you have a reasonable chance of getting it right. Otherwise, not so sure. Then with SMB2, uh, it looks a lot the same in the simple cases. In the simple cases where 
Uh, in SMP2, the compounding model changes. Uh, your first request and your second request may be related or unrelated. When, when they're related, it means that you can, for example, open a file of the first request, and the second one can use that file handle. This is sort of interesting. So, in the case where they're related, this looks quite a bit like SMB1. You go through, it could be one, an example, a real example of this might be open, get out, or close. That's what, how this would come across on the wire. It looks like this. And our model still works. That's great. Send it out. Now, when they get to be unrelated, you know, reading the spec, I kind of got a sad feeling in my stomach. I thought, oh no, our locking model isn't going to work. Our threading model isn't going to work. What am I going to do? Because in theory, any of these can block. You don't really know the order they're going to complete. You can't hold up one arbitrarily for the other. You can't necessarily do serial processing anymore. So now what? You know, some head scratching. Uh, keep reading the spec. Uh, there's this notion of async, which is interesting. Actually, going back for a second. Um, In this model, each, each of those requests has a single response, and that's it. Um, the SMB2 defines that for operations that are going to take a while, you're supposed to do a, a two-step response scheme. So there's, and I'll show you what that looks like here. Uh, so you're, you're going through processing something, and you, and you, and you discover, OK, um, <coughs> request one, one, maybe it's an open, that goes fine. Okay. Continue forward. Request two, we discover it needs to go async. That means it's something that can block for quite a while. Let's say it needs an open where an off block cache delegation uh, recall needs to happen. You're really not supposed to, really, you're not ever really supposed to hold up a request in SMB2 for a long time. In fact, the client will send you a reset packet if you, if you delay it too long. It's one of, the, one of the unfortunate pieces. You're supposed to send it back status pending the magic. Uh, error return. Not, there are a bunch of error returns in SMB that are not really errors. That's one of them. It just says, I'm working on it. Be patient. Uh, and in this case, it's another interesting side effect. If, if uh, command 3 needed state from command 2, it's going to get an error because it's going to just see the state that should have been created by command 2 isn't there. So whatever happens, happens. Um, but the interesting point is none of these took a long time, so we can still build, you know, we can still build a compounded response for a compounded request. I'll show you here, we just send it out. Uh, and when that guy that went that went in the spec we talk about it, we call this the command is gone async, which means it gets two replies. So if we see the uh, let's see, do I get a pointer that shows my Anyway, this after the Command that wait async actually completes, we send out this uh, sort of 2A response, if you like, to, to actually finish the operation. Now, continuing reading on, what happens when multiple things need to go async? Again, I'm sort of looking at the spec, feeling somewhat worried. Gee, I'm not sure this threading model is going to work. Um, for background, some implementations simply explode one of these uh, compound requests, like I showed a few slides earlier, into multiple worker threads and do synchronization between the threads, and that's it. And I really didn't want to do that, if it could help, because it's going to blow my schedule. <laughs> so, um, we had the nod and had some interesting discussions, and including some at the uh, Storage Developer Conference last fall and got a chance to talk with some of the folks from Microsoft. David Cruzy was one who really deserves a credit for it. He's their architect for protocols at Microsoft. Nice guy. Mentioned, well, you know, the server is allowed to say no. Oh, that's just exactly the clue I needed. <laughs> yeah, sorry to wire the mic. Um, so it turns out then that the problem of multi -things, multiple things going async, uh, you're not obligated to deal with. So we have this important simplification we can use. And it actually gets better than this. So, but let's talk about what happens with limited async. So here we have our you know, work 
working on request one. Request two happens, we discover needs to go async. We return status pending for that guy. So we're still building a compounded response just like we did with SMB1. Second one comes in and, gets, and wants to go async. We give them another special error that says, uh, sorry, no resources. You can't go async with this command. And the spec obligates the client to, and then, and then we go ahead and send out, you know, when, when it finishes, that this worker continues working on this compound and, and its one async job is, is the uh, request two, and eventually it sends out its error two. But what happens with request three that tried to go async and got uh, no resources is that the client, according to spec, learns, oh, I couldn't, that couldn't go as a compound for whatever reason. The server told me that that couldn't be processed as part of the compound. It simply comes back with it separately. Uh, and then, uh, you know, another worker thread comes along and uh, lets it have its async response when it's, when it's done. So that's great. That, that lets us preserve the compound request, compound <coughs> response, single worker model. And uh, you could some horrible denial of services with a sufficiently warped compound request, couldn't you, without being able to say no? Yeah, that's called code nomicon. We, we bought that tool. It's <laughs> a, you know, I, saw a I saw a compound coming in that was several megabytes long. It's, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> Like we, we survived that test now. We didn't do it initially. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, with you know, summarizing our design changes, uh, we, were, we found we could stick with the current thread model with some clever tricks and some important clues. Um, and so the SMB2 dispatch loop looks a lot like the SMB1. But it, but it is really a new implementation. It, it, it in particular has to deal with the fact that each request um, has its own header and so forth, as, as you see here. The, the formatting is really very different, and there's this notion of needing to store away async state to go handle it later. So that's that's one of the bigger pieces. But aside from, you know, with that piece out of the way, that was the one that you know took a month or something to get that working. And uh, a lot of the uh, 18 command handles, a lot of those were like a day. You know, cancel requests. You know, and, and could have, a lot of them could be very, very similar to SMB1 requests. Um, some other things that had to happen in the sort of as far as design changes. Uh, SMB1 had this fault. It had two notions of security: extended security, which is the more modern NT4 and later thing, and it had old style security and a fallback mechanism. And SMB2, they ditched the fallback mechanism. So that everybody's going to extend security. Well, bad news is that was one of our pieces of technical debt. We didn't actually have extended security fully fleshed out, so we had to do that. Uh, and we wanted to do some other improvements to the RPC stack. Uh, got some things we wanted to improve, but particularly the, it kind of misused doors because whoever did the porting work on this, I think, just really loved doors and thought, well, I'm just going to use them everywhere. And <laughs> So anyway, moving on. Uh, any questions at this point? I have one. Yeah. So, in terms of handling the motor asyncs, do you consider uh, possibly just having instead of uh, trying to enqueue to your task queue many different things, do you consider just basically chaining the asyncs so that once one async finished, it would enqueue for the next async to be processed? I consider that, but the concern is that for unrelated requests, one could block the other potentially indefinitely. Uh, and there, that? I consider doing uh, handling. It sounds like you're describing uh, an alternative where you handle the asyncs uh, serially yes. to chain them together. The problem is that the asyncs might be unrelated, uh, and therefore, if the first one takes a long time to complete, but the second one could have completed. You know, the first one might take 30 seconds to complete. Like, uh, as a real world example, the most common case of async that we see is this NT notify thing, or this uh, whatever, SMB2 notify, which is basically a request. It's an unusual request because it doesn't return until something changes in the, in the directory. It's what Explorer uses to have your, your window update when somebody adds a file or whatever. So that can block potentially indefinitely, and there could be another async uh, for an open compound that's unrelated. And so, if you chain the one that is following the uh, the async for notify, could could be blocked potentially indefinitely. Something that you might actually be able to do is break 
it up into a dependency graph, and then uh, you can actually have multiple ones in flight at the same time. Right. And that's that's the multi. That's the model I described. If you go way, uh, I don't want to go back. But the one that I that I showed three worker threads working in parallel. Yes. Well, some implementations simply explode the compound on the way in and 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 fan out to multiple threads. And that's that's an easy. You know, that's a design-wise straightforward way to do that. Uh, it would have caused havoc with the code that we're trying to work in. Okay. It's and well, and, and let me get to this. The interesting thing, did, did I point this out? Uh, I have a slide here where I say, uh, where's the one more? Yeah. So, did I skip over the text where I say, you know, basically this, this actually never happens. This, that was the interesting part. Yeah, this one. I, I should call more attention to this. So after all that worry, the interesting thing is that you don't actually have to deal with this problem. If you want to be spec compliant, you should deal with the possibility that some evil client is going to send you multiple things that need to go async. But it turns out that in the real world, that just simply doesn't happen. The, uh, the, the, the guy building the request on the client side has a fairly limited number of cases where he needs to go <coughs> async with a request. So, for example, Explorer is wanting to, you know, what we'll often get with Explorer is an open uh, SME node. <coughs> so that's just, he's asking to. Tell me when the directory changes. And that's it. The anti notify is the end of the compound. There's not really a problem. So, so in fact, we've, we've never seen in traces uh, a compound other than from things like Codenomicon and Evil Test Tool that actually tries to go async with multiple elements. So, in fact, uh, this compromise works very, very nicely and happens to be spec compliant if somebody decided, oh, yeah, I really want to get fancy and try and do multiple async things. So, I, I, I think it's an excellent compromise, and I'm, I'm really thankful for. We got for for helping us find something that let us uh, move forward in a, on an easy path. <coughs> you know. So uh, let's see. Move forward to there we are. Um, this is what the architecture looks like uh, after this work. Um, basically, most of the work falls in this block. Actually, this block didn't exist uh, before our project, and then. Uh, additional portion of work happens uh, up in the um, authentication services layer. People might not, if you haven't wandered through this code, people might not realize that this is actually a really nice property of it. The only things that are internal in this implementation are the uh, critical data movement elements. Quite a lot of the code is, is up in user space. Um, you know, in, in general, people frown these days on, you know, you, or put it differently, you have to have a good reason to be in kernel. And the reason that a lot of this stuff is in kernel is actually right below this bottom circle. I should have a way to do pointers here. Um, but the FEMMA calls, there, there's a lot of traffic from FEM for op-lock notifications and, uh, you know, lots of things. There's an amazing amount of traffic. So if you were to do that through some sort of an up-lock, up-call mechanism, it's going to be very hard to do that and, and be performing. So really what this, this is not so much about, I mean, I remember when this code initially went in, somebody, uh, Jeremy, a guy I know, said, well, what, the CPUs magically run faster in a supervisor mode? What, why do you need to be a girl for, you know? <laughs> and it's not that they run faster, it's that the information you need and the, and the event flow is nearby. That's really what it amounts to. So, yeah, anyways, that's where the work falls. Let me, uh, let's see, we're at 24 minutes. We'll skip through some of the other stuff. Um, so I already talked a little bit about looking at the spec and the challenges and so forth, you know, uh, as far as like, what we learned developing this code and, and so forth. Uh, it was a bit daunting at the beginning of it to look at, I have to say. 400 pages of spec to read and some difficult things to figure out. We, we definitely, you know, I, I knew right at the beginning that we were going to need a way, we are need to come up with some way to move fast. Uh, it's one of my biggest concerns at the beginning of this. Um, so how do we do that? And I'm, I'm actually pretty proud of what we did. I, I, I took some personal risk with, within the organization to say, you know, if this is going to cost us something to do and it's going to speed our development, but I want to do it anyway. It's a worthwhile investment. So basically, um, Beyond you know, the design stuff I described, we're trying to reuse the design as, as much as we can. Uh, and, and 
work incrementally and so forth. Uh, I'll, I'll skip through. Most of this is pretty familiar stuff, I think. You know, nothing gross shattering here. But this is the uh, this is the part I kind of want to brag about to developers and that, that I'm proud of it and it helped us a lot. Um, and I don't get to claim credit for the idea. The credit was actually, you know, the, I think ZFS was one of them. Certainly predated this with uh, being able to compile all ZFS code in user space. It's actually not the first implementation. It's funny, I actually did. Uh, well, I shouldn't say. But <laughs> uh, I, I've done this before for previous projects years ago. The, the idea of you know, so simulating a kernel environment for user space with different methods and so forth is a very strong method. So we decided to do this, basically. And that, um, Many of the interfaces that we needed were already there. The Z pool had code that we could rip off to <coughs> borrow uh, to do a lot of this. There were quite a few more that we needed to uh, to stub out and so forth. So um, I'll show you what that ends up looking like. So this is what the normal architecture for deployment looks like. And then after it's ported for this, uh, what we're calling the fake server in, in user space, all the KMod code lands in this new library, which is basically uh, build, you know, builds the exact same kernel code, but from some make file reach over tricks to go grab stuff out of UTS and so forth. We, so we build this big, is that readable? Mm -hmm. uh, LibFK SMB serve, as for fake SMB serve. Very little changes in there, a, a couple little FDFs, a couple files that we had to leave out because of things like credential handling, you know, as I mentioned. We took some compromises. But anyway, the point of this was to be able to do edit, compile, debug, and all the protocol handling code quickly uh, in a friendly environment, not requiring reboots and so forth. Uh, fake kernel, we separated out uh, with the hopes that it could be used by other projects in a similar vein at some point. It's very, it's intentionally very similar to what's in libz pool today. I don't know if the folks who work on ZFS are interested in trying to um, you know, share this version of that set of stubs and so forth or not. It's a possibility. I didn't worry about that again. I had a very tight schedule trying to get this to happen, get it to do what we needed it to do as quickly as possible. Um, but, it, but it works very well for us. Uh, you know, it was, and it was a huge leg up for uh, being able to get work done fast. So basically, um, you know, like I said, we can do all sorts of all of our protocol level Work, work on the command handlers very easily. We can, you know, for the particularly the junior folks, we'd much rather stop and work in a source level debugger. And I, and I have some notes to myself to, to uh, mention here. I, the source level debugger is, uh, is kind of a, an old argument that uh, often got squatted down in Sun. It's an, an interesting one to me because I'm. I am a pragmatist, and I, I really think there is a, a place for all of these things. And uh, you know, I love Dtrace; we use it all the time. However, I'll observe that while Dtrace excels at getting you to near where your problem is, you, what typically happens after you get near to where your problem is is you have new questions that you're going to ask about. Okay, what's what in detail is happening there? And what you end up doing is modifying your Dtrace script, running your experiment again. That's actually not as fast as getting near to the problem on the D-trace and then saying, okay, well, I'm just going to set a breakpoint there and stop and look around. <laughs> and particularly being able to look at local variables and so forth. Uh, I claim that's the best of both worlds. It was huge for us to be able to do that. Uh, we use all these tools. I also use MDB. I'm prepared to demo that maybe while you're eating your pizza or something. <laughs> I, I thought it was really cool, actually. If you go back to this uh, picture, uh, MDB has a module that knows how to look at the uh, SMB serve code. And it just works. Uh, the same when pointed to the library, the same way the libz cool thing versus the Z, the, you know, the ZFS came out first. I thought that was really cool. Right? Uh, so you can run, you, you, you can walk the data structures and list all your handles and stuff like that. It's very, very nice. Um, you have some other things, just partial build scripts to be able to do a quick edit, compile, debug. I, I can't emphasize enough how much that uh, speeds up development to be able to do that. You can compile with CTF, there's no way to use one as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, some people get excited when they say, oh, gee, move the, you know, particularly the ones that were naysayers about, you know, kernel mode, anything. Like, well, gee, can we, you know, can we have this? Let's move it to user mode. Yeah, yeah, you know. Well, hold on. <laughs> um, 
we really didn't want to take on authentication. In fact, that's one of the, you don't have the interfaces you need to do authentication to, to do, in order to do authentication properly in a user mode implementation, you would need, need to be able to have per thread credentials. We basically don't really have a way to do that. Uh, and I didn't really want to do that. It wasn't necessary for what we were trying to accomplish here. So I just stuck all of that out. And you can ask what your credential is, it's going to say, me or you. You can ask to change your credential, it'll say, yeah, I did. <laughs> and uh, sync with zones. What zone am I? Here's the cool zone. Create a zone, sorry, you can't. You know. <laughs> and uh, in the VFS, VFS layer simulation, was it, that was actually one of the pieces of a fair amount of work. Um, you know, the VFS is a very different, different model of interaction versus user space open flows. Uh, so we came up with something. That's actually the, about the third time I've done that for various reasons. Uh, this one works reasonably well, but uh, one of the things it does is for every V node that's active, it keeps an open file scripter. And so it always uses, it uses the add form of things. So when you do a lookup, you actually open each element of the path in turn and do a, do a open act to get the next element. And it means that nowhere in the, uh, well, actually, and we do remember, there's a place in the act for V, you need to handle V path support. Uh, so there's one case in reading where we kind of reach in and tell the fake thought layer that, gee, you need to update your V path. But other than that, it doesn't have much knowledge about full paths, which works nicely. Uh, any questions at that point? I'm just about out of time, I guess, but. You can take, you can take another right. five, five, five to 10, maybe 15. The food is here and All right. inside. I'll keep it quick then. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, it, it really was a huge, uh, you know, I wish I had a way to measure this, but I, I estimate that, uh, I estimate it could easily have taken us twice as long without this to, to do the rest of the SMB stuff without the, the tricks we had for accelerating development. Um, just because of the times you'd have to spend waiting for reboots among other things, working in VMs and so forth. Uh, and it was very satisfying to be able to pay down some technical debt. There's some things that I knew, have known for a while, really needed some attention. Uh, the other, I'll, I'll make a, a comment for incremental development. There were, there were people at the time saying, well, you know, just throw it away and start over. And projects that, you know, and I just, I, that scared me. Too many projects I've seen to try to throw it away and start over, basically just never finish. So. So that's, that's, that's what we did. Um, we did invest a little bit in, in uh, some automated testing. Pretty pretty simple scale, really. Just some uh, scripting to through our Jenkins server to reach over to a test server and install the bits and fire up some SMB torture run, things like that, and then hand that off to our QA people to take from there. Uh, that's sort of the stuff that worked well and not so well. Uh, you know, there, <laughs> one of the one of the risks with um, extending some code that looks like it needs to does what you needed to do. For example, rename. You know, SMB one had a, you know of course three versions of rename, including one that has a sort of a set file info version. Well, it turned out the SMB one version of it actually only really supports rename in the current directory. So I inherited that bug in SMB two, and we actually got our first version of it had that bug, and somebody called in. You know, well, rename doesn't work. What do you mean it doesn't work? We tested that. Uh, but it only worked in the root directory. So grew to the share. That was kind of embarrassing. Uh, and a test hole. And so it's just a point that protocols like these have a lot of possible operations. It's very hard to test. Uh, and you know, we did pretty well. It didn't crash all over the place or anything like that. But I think in general, with a, with a major new feature like something like Masashi Masaki has been doing or SMB2, it'd really be wise to kind of get it out in, in a feature preview form of some, some methods so that people can try it out, hopefully in non-production environments, give you some feedback and so forth. Uh, we argued about that, or perhaps, over, you know, I think maybe we as an organization might have been overconfident about where it really was. There's a commit, there's a famous commit that, you know, in the uh, blog that says SMB2 should be enabled by default. That was one I was worried about this one. <laughs> uh, 
I didn't really want to do it, but then we did. And, uh, so we got a lot of feedback really quickly. <laughs> and acted on that. And uh, so now it's in pretty good shape, I would say. So briefly on next steps, you know, what, what a lot of people here probably want to know. Uh, when can we get this in Lumos? What else is coming? Uh, basically, uh, SMB2 optional features and SMB3 support and uh, a couple of things. But basically, the system they're not, I didn't really want to go into too much detail, but one of the things that we're interested in is supporting Hyper-V. Uh, Hyper-V requires SMB3 protocol level and requires durable handles. Yes. We'll probably just do that for a start and try to make sure that integrity works. But otherwise, all these optional features are kind of the, yeah, well, that's nice, but what actually requires them? Yeah. I'll wait until you, yeah, there you go. And then, as far as upstream to Lumos, I feel slightly guilty about this. You know, Lumos is, we've gone two years or something without really substantial pushing stuff upstream, and, and, and I should apologize for that. And, Really, the only reason is that we're really a pretty thin organization for what we're trying to do, including this project. You know, this project only had a couple people at most, you know, and a lot of times it's just me. So uh, we could use help with that, uh, you know, and, and I'm ready to try and help. There's there's a fork on GitHub that's actually the, the code I'm, I can run here. Uh, just to, to give you an idea of the, of the size of it, I ran some little statistics. This is in reverse chronological order. Uh, about two years of work broken up into some reasonable sized chunks, testable chunks. Uh, and those are lines of code. It adds up to a lot of code. Are you know, your changes incrementally reviewable? And what level of expertise do you need to have about SIS in particular to have a useful meaningful review? Yeah, I don't know what the solution for that is. All this work was reviewed internally. Uh, if you know, and it's got some field testing now. You know, it's a, we probably should take that discussion offline. But uh, I'm just thinking how whether how whether it's <coughs> another round of review and how to accomplish that are questions I don't know the answers to. Sorry, I heard you both talking and I couldn't hear anything. So, we'll, we'll talk about that. Yeah, those are both those are good questions. You know, what what additional review is needed. That'd be a good discussion to have more generally because we obviously have the same problem, other folks have the same problem. One of the things that we do is for stuff that we know we're going to upstream to make sure that the code reviewers are in the get commit line on it, it downstream yeah. so you know exactly who's looked at it. Yeah. Um, because I think for, I mean, bluntly for a lot of this stuff, I mean, if it's been code reviewed internally with an organization with any credibility whatsoever, I mean, it's, it's, been for all practical purposes code review, right? Yeah, it's like yeah. With, with, with D-Trace changes for you guys, I, I'm going to be cool with that. Right. If MZFS or Delphix, I'm going to be cool with that. Right. And, and we have this problem right so now. Matt, exactly. Matt is sitting on this on, on some pretty big wads that need to go in that are blocked on review. Yeah. And and we don't want to block things, I think, unnecessarily yeah. on... I don't think those, I don't think his wads are going to get blocked. Right, no, no, I know, but that's what I'm saying. That, so I think it would be actually helpful, I think, to a certain degree codify some of the corollary to that, why would these block plots be blocked? No, no, no. I, but I think that it's, so it would be actually helpful. So one of the things we've been doing, like I said, is adding just the code review lines um, when we have wads that we know we're going to go upstream. Um, and so maybe you know, we weren't good about that about adding code review information to our commits. A few of them have them, and unfortunately, worse, we changed code review systems and retired the old one at some point during the stuff. So I went back and tried to get the, <laughs> the reviewer information with the you know the reviews are theory. Theory all there out on review board, you know, they have review board and then something else, and now we're the last thing. My guess also is that, that because you've had incremental changes, early early reviewers, you know, you probably have reviewers who review code that was subsequently changed, and I don't know if you, I don't, maybe you could do, but I, I don't know if you have an exhaustive review of and the whole code base yeah. as it stands today. Finally, what? Uh, Finish the pres like Gordon, finish the presentation. Yeah, we should probably yeah, so let finish up. Yeah. Well, that's that's pretty much it. Um, that's what we're moving on to is you know optional features and SME three. Thank you. Can you kill your mic?